Stand by. Okay, everybody, this is uh, Anthony Teoli. I'm the, I'm the regional director for the Alaska Region Training and Technical Assistance Center here in uh, Wasilla, Alaska. And uh, we're gonna launch our national webinar on building organizational infrastructure and strengthening administrative capacity. Today's webinar is hosted by the Alaska Region. We are one of four regional training and technical assistance centers. Um, that uh, are resources of the administration for Native Americans. We support our applicants and a and grantees uh, with successfully administering and, and applying for uh, ANA funding. And um, we also have a, a fifth national technical assistance center, which is operated by Sister Sky, and that is focused on native languages. So a couple of announcements um, coming up. Our next webinar will be on August 23rd, which is going to be focused on organizational development, highlighting community organizational development. And this will be hosted by the Pacific Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. So uh, for more information and to register for that webinar, go to the Pacific Region website, um, which is anapacificbasin.org, and uh, you can register there. Also, we have a Native, Native American Languages Summit coming up, honoring the gift of Native American languages, and that's going to be on August 28th and 29th. Okay, today's webinar is going to be focused on building organizational infrastructure and strengthening administrative capacity. And um, it's, it's a topic that uh, is, is really uh, Dear to our hearts here in Alaska, because we we have a lot of smaller organizations in Alaska that are still building their capacity. Um, they, they're faced with unique challenges in doing that, and uh, particularly when it comes to applying for complex funding sources with a lot of uh, regulatory compliance, uh, like federal grants. And um, so. <clears throat> um, we're going to be exploring some best practices and the unique needs of building your organization's infrastructure and administrative capacity. And there's definitely going to be a, a focus on technology in this. We've got a couple of presentations that are looking at uh, strengthening IT capacity within tribal and native organizations. And uh, I'm going to be cover, covering a few general organizational assessment tools that you might find useful and uh, looking at uh, resources that are available to you um, to support your capacity building efforts. The presenters today will be myself uh, doing the introduction, and then we have uh, Jason Williams, the director of IT at Chugachmute, 
in Anchorage, Alaska. We have Danielle Malchoff, the project director for Port Graham, uh, who received an ANA grant to modernize their office. And we have Robin Harkin, the project director for the Coquille Tribe Land Use and GIS ANA project. And then Richard Perry will be moderating in the background for a Q&A and doing the Q&A at the tail end. So our guest speakers, uh, as I mentioned, are Jason Williams. He's the IT director for Ch Chugachamute, responsible for managing all Chugachamute's uh, network infrastructure and supporting their member uh, tribes as well, um, including the telehealth and electronic health record systems, which here in Alaska, telehealth is really critical due to the remote location of our, of our tribes. Uh, uh, which you can't drive to in the Chugachmi region, you have to fly to. He has over 20 years of, of experience in the IT world, uh, including extensive experience working in rural Alaska and, and Alaska Native organizations. We also have Danielle Malchoff, uh, who is the project director in Port Graham. Danielle is Sukhbat, uh, also known as Alutik, um, and she's, she's from Port Graham. Her experience is varied and includes, uh, looks like forestry work uh, in Port Graham, working on the docks in the fishing industry, working as a clinic receptionist in human resources, and currently as program manager for the ANA grant. Danielle has lived most of her life in her small village and in her free time leads the Baluik Alutik dancers and volunteers as a coach for the Native Youth Olympics. And lastly, we have Robin Harkins, who's the director of GIS services with the Coquille Indian tribe, um, which I read the pronunciation for the city is slightly different. I hope I have that correct. Robin is the director of GIS services and is a certified forester to the Society of American Foresters, working over 12 years in the field. And her work for the tribe involves monitoring, support, and management of the tribe's GIS systems. Since joining the tribe, She's worked on data organization, building models and tools to automate tasks, and training employees in the use of GIS and GPS software and equipment. So welcome to all of our presenters. <clears throat> okay, so organizational capacity. Um, this is actually, it's a huge field, and um, a lot of the work in this field, a lot of the, the theory has been developed actually in the international realm through um, NGO development, which a lot of the nonprofits are referred to as non-governmental organizations overseas, and uh, I think in the Pacific region to some degree as well. So there's been a lot of development and theory around organizational capacity and, and uh, capacity assessments uh, in an international field, and to some degree in the tribal arena. Um, so what is it? Well, it deals with organizational effectiveness, for sure, which is the ability of an organization to fulfill its mission through effective leadership and governance, sound management, and the alignment of measurable outcomes with strategies, services, resources, and partners. Organizational capacity is the wide range of capabilities, knowledge, and resources that organizations need to be effective. Capacity assessment is the use of standardized of a standardized process or formal instrument to assess facets of organizational capacity and identify areas of relative strength and weakness. And if you if you do some searching on the internet, you'll find that there are literally dozens of different capacity assessment tools measuring different domains and, and elements of capacity. And capacity building is the internal or external strategies that use resources or technical assistance, for instance, from your TTA centers, to strengthen an organization's capabilities to enhance organizational effectiveness. So those are some working definitions. Now, why is this even relevant or important? Well, effectiveness is really key. And when we look at um, the effectiveness of tribes and native organizations implementing ANA projects, for example, um, 
addressing capacity early on can really help you to be more successful and more effective in implementing your projects. And ANA has analyzed through annual reviews and impact assessments uh, the success rate of, of projects, and we have different levels of success in, in terms of meeting objectives for our ANA grants region by region. So in the Alaska region, um, based on this data, we actually have not been as successful compared to other regions. And that's in part due to some of the really unique challenges that we face here. Uh, developing capacity, especially in the more remote communities where it's very difficult to, uh, to staff projects, um, to a lot of tribal members have difficulty accessing training and education because of their remote locations. So we're just faced with a lot of unique challenges um, that, are, that are unique. And um, so capacity building is really a big issue for us in Alaska. And um, it's not just Alaska, but all the regions. So when we look at some of these tools for you know, stepping back and seeing where do we stand in terms of our capacity in these different areas, addressing that early on can help. The other, re the other reason to be concerned about capacity is more from a compliance perspective. And I don't actually have a slide on this, but um, the new uniform administrative requirements that have come down through 2 CFR Part 200, they, they speak about uh, what you need to have in place to successfully administer federal funds and to be fully compliant. And one of the new things that are, that are that's part of that is the requirement for the government to do risk assessments on grantees um, where they're going to assess your your ability to administer funds uh, procure services and goods um, manage property and uh, and a big emphasis on financial your financial systems so a lot of the from a compliance perspective a lot of the capacity is coming down from, from the federal regulations. Um, so this slide that you're looking at right now is kind of a, it was a, something that we developed to put more of a sort of a cultural or native twist to capacity assessments. And I'm gonna go through several different tools, but this is a developmental uh, scale that uh, some some tools use, but I liked it because uh, if we're looking at our systems from a sort of a, a native perspective, uh, especially in Alaska where salmon, for example, is uh, such an important part of our lives here, and you look at the, the development cycle of the salmon, we start off with the egg at birth, and then you've got the, the adolescent fry, and then after so many years, you know, they come back into the rivers, they're mature, they're bright. You know, there's nothing more beautiful than a bright salmon. Uh, and then, um, of course, they spawn, and then they're not quite so pretty. And so that's, uh, this is a development scale that, that we adapted. And this is a quick poll for you just to get to warm you up to assessing your systems. So looking back or thinking back to our effectiveness, um, one of the biggest challenges that Alaska faces and actually all, a lot of the regions face is, is retaining qualified personnel. So does your organization have a well-developed uh, employee compensation and benefits package? So if your organization does not, then you could, you could say, A, hey, if you are developing, you've got a, a benefits plan that's in the works, but sort of ad hoc, still being defined as needed, you're sort of at the fry stage. If you've got a well-defined compensation plan with well-defined job descriptions, a stellar employee handbook, a well-defined benefits program where you've, you've developed uh, like a 401k program and other uh, complex benefits, 
to support your employees. And we, we have some regional urban uh, native organizations in Alaska that have just phenomenal benefits programs. Um, then you're at the maturity stage. And then it's possible that maybe you've developed those things, but uh, you're kind of a little bit outdated and you're, you're no longer as competitive. So you, you kind of, you're entering the spawning stage and you want to, maybe you want to reconsider where you're at and, and go back and reassess your plans so you can be more competitive. So um, this is a quick poll. So where do you, where do you all stand? Um, a, B, C, or D? And the poll is open. So hoping to get some responses. Oh, let's wait a couple seconds. I don't know, maybe about 30 seconds here. To see if anybody's willing to share where they think their their employee compensation and benefits package stands with their organization. So Richard, I don't know if you have a way to close that poll and get any preliminary results, because um, I need to move on. Okay, the poll has ended and we've got, uh, so we've got a little bit of a range, uh, several people that didn't answer, um, a couple that think they're sort of in the spawned out stage and, and uh, their council or their their board needs to take a look at things again. Um, quite a few of you responded that your your systems are mature, which is great. So thanks. So that's just an, a, an example of a, uh, an assessment question. So we have I have a number of tools that I'm gonna we're gonna send it out to you after the webinar. We're gonna email you the files. Um, I'm gonna cover a couple of them, and like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the tools that are more developed are coming from the international arena. For instance, the uh, USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, uh, has spent multi-millions, possibly billions, in development work around the globe. And so they have a lot of very developed uh, tools. Um, I'm not sending one of those, but that's just an example. There's another one I'm gonna share that, that's uh, focused on international NGOs. I'll cover that one. And then, um, we have developed some of our own tools through the ANA TTA centers, and I'll mention those. And uh, lastly, um, I was really excited. Uh, last night I found a very cool tool that uh, the, the National Corporation for Community Service has developed, uh, and we'll go over that one too. So this first one is um, one that the TTA centers are using and it, here's the elements that it covers. It covers your local capacity. This one was kind of developed for our project planning and development training to assess uh, your preparedness for, for implementing projects. And uh, it looks at, do you have grant writing capacity? Do you have policies and procedures in place for your organization? Um, looking at your, your administration and, and really, uh, are, you know, are you looking at funding from a needs community needs basis, or are you just chasing the next grant that comes out? Because that's really uh, something that we, we focus on, which is community-based project planning and basing it on your actual needs. Um, and that covers personal management, financial management, and procurement. So this is one that we developed and used uh, through the TTA centers. Um, the next one, is there's actually two that are in our grants management toolkit. And uh, the first one is a sample self-assessment tool. This one is good for like if you've, you've gotten funding and you wanna make sure you're, you've got the right systems in place. It's got some, some questions that can guide you and help you assess where you're at in terms of your program management, uh, your partnerships, your staff management, uh, are you tracking your non-federal share? Do you have things? Do you have a system in place to do that? 
um, some some financial management, some reporting questions to help you gauge uh, whether you, you've got uh, systems in place for that. Um, so it's kind of a, a broader tool, and it's it's in the grants management toolkit. Uh, the other one that's that's really more developed and focused on accounting and finance is our is our financial policies and procedures self-assessment tool. And this one goes into the the nuts and bolts of administering funds from a fiscal financial perspective, looking at your cash procedures, your cash disbursements, whether you're doing bank reconciliations, payroll, travel, um, tracking your equipment and property, and your budget. So, like I said, we'll be sending these tools out to you so you can look at them. Uh, so those are the a and ones that we've developed internally. And then the next one is from the international NGO sector. And this one is probably more appropriate for small to medium-sized nonprofits. It's a very well-developed financial uh, management assessment tool. And uh, it's it's got an Excel version of it, so you can go through and you can check off. And then it's got a reporting feature on it where it gives you a score and a tally so you can see where you're at. And it covers uh, several different areas of financial management, from planning and budgeting to your basic accounting systems to financial reporting, internal controls, grant management, and staffing. So it's a, it's really uh, it's a good tool for looking at your financial ability uh, to manage grants. And this is just an example of some of the kinds of questions in the format. Uh, where you're looking at best practices and whether you are implementing these best practices. For instance, are your budgets prepared in good time for all the costs of running the organization? Um, are the finance and program staff involved in setting budgets? Are your project budgets based on cost of planned activities? Um, so just just to give you an example. Okay, next slide. All right, the next tool and the last one that I'm going to cover is the one that I actually found last night that I got really excited about. This is from 2017, um, so it's recent. It's a, it's an organizational capacity assessment tool. And I think this one really conform or maybe conforms not the word, but it's real consistent and congruent with ANA's philosophy of community-based projects and programs. And um, it, it it is kind of geared towards nonprofits as well. Um, it's not specifically tribal, um, but as a general tool, I think it's it's still very applicable to tribal operations and, of course, native nonprofits. Um, so a little bit about the National Corporation. You can go back one real quick. Uh, established in 1993, it's a federal agency that engages millions of people through its core programs, AmeriCorps and Senior Corps, and, of course, AmeriCorps, uh, is very active in a lot of uh, native and tribal communities. And the mission is to improve lives, strengthen communities, and foster civic engagement. And they developed the organizational capacity assessment tool to aid communities in the promotion of organizational capacity. Okay, so next one. So they have, uh, this is a, a well-researched tool. They looked at a lot of the theory and literature that's out there. And they have got, they've got a good model. They look at, um, from the top, they look at the leadership capacity of the organization in terms of your vision and mission, your governance, your strategy and planning, and your cultures and values, your, your corporate or your tribal native organization culture and values. Um, and then it looks at your internal focus. So looking at your management and operations internally. And then this is what's really, I think, relevant to ANA is your external focus because we really talk a lot about um, partnerships and community-based um, involvement. So these uh, domains addressing the external focus, service capacity and community engagement capacity, I think are real relevant. And then at the bottom is the evaluative capacity. And that's your ability to evaluate your programs, which a lot of you probably have realized with ANA, for example, uh, especially with the last FOAs that came out, there's a heavy, much greater emphasis now on 
on outcomes and documenting uh, the changes that are being made and achieved through your projects. So that's another reason why I like this tool. Next slide. All right, so just real quickly to go through these, um, the <clears throat> this tool, looking at your leadership management and operations, uh, like I said, it covers your vision and, and mission, your leadership and governance, strategy and planning, culture and values. And then on the internal facing side, it covers financial management, HR, infrastructure and IT. And uh, I'm glad that they included IT in this one because that's increasingly a critical uh, component for tribal and native organizations to be successful, uh, especially since we're working with partners that are global, um, with federal systems that are all internet and web-based. So um, next slide. The other, the other domains within this tool that are addressed is your community engagement, which addresses your ability to uh, pursue funds through fund development, uh, your strategies for communications and advocacy, uh, how you deal with volunteer management and community partnerships, and then your service capacity, which is looking at your project design, your program implementation, and your performance management. So this is a really well-rounded tool that can give you some insight into all these different areas, which, like I said, is really consistent with A&E's approach. Okay, next slide. And then once you go through the, oh, the last one is evaluative capacity, data collection, measuring impact, um, continuous learning and improvement, which is a, a theme now. Well, it's been a theme for a while, but definitely, you know, learning from your, uh, from your challenges and applying those for future projects. Uh, the next slide. And then once you go through their tool, it's simple to, it's very simple to go through. You just check off whether, uh, the, um, whether, uh, the question applies to you or not. And then you do a tally and a percentage. So you, you can come up with a quick, uh, score of each of these different areas, uh, once you're done with it. So like I said, these different tools we will share with you. Uh, we'll send out an email so that you have those. And, uh, let's go into the next slide. All right, so that was just a quick quick overview of some different capacity assessment tools. And uh, our first presentation is gonna be by Jason Williams. He's gonna focus in on uh, IT. And then after that, um, Danielle will be talking about her project, which actually Jason has provided support for in Port Graham. Um, and Jason is the IT director for Chugachmute. And that's a, a, a sort of a, a Regional Consortium for the Chugach Tribes, um, which includes Port Graham, uh, Nonwalik, uh, I believe Tatitlik, and then maybe I'm missing a couple others, but sorry. Um, okay, Jason. Thank you. Uh, so, um, as Anthony mentioned, I'm the Director of IT for Chugach. We have uh, five uh, clinics that we manage. Uh, we've got one in Seward, Alaska. Uh, we've got one in Tatitlik, one in uh, Port Graham, one in Nanwalik, and one in Chenega Bay. Um, all of those villages, with the exception of Seward, are only accessible by boat or air. So um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, Port Graham Tribal Office. They they came to us about two years ago, and were, um, we, we spoke with them on uh, some problems that they were experiencing in their office. They had some some, some pretty outdated equipment. Uh, we're talking about computers, wiring, uh, nowhere to store data, uh, outdated phone systems. Um, and so we uh, decided that we would do some uh, uh, help with them and partner up on a project to uh, get their technology upgraded. So we found the uh, grant, we applied for it, and we were funded um, for uh, some technology upgrades in that location. Prior to, prior, prior to applying for the grant, we, we decided that we would need to do a technology assessment in that region. So I developed a tool that would kind of give us a little bit of an idea of where their, 
where they're at with technology. Now, since we do not provide IT support directly to the Port Graham Tribal Office, we are just kind of a, oh boy, I don't, I don't even know how to explain the relationship. They are the tribal office in the region where we run our um, clinic. So we have sort of a, a good relationship with them, meaning that we do assist them with things, but um, we do not provide Oh boy, I'm trying to, having a hard time explaining the relationship there. Um, we don't work for them, they don't work for us, but we help them. <laughs> That's the, the easiest way for me to explain it. Um, so anyways, we, we developed a, a needs assessment tool, uh, and with that said, we developed this tool in order to get a better understanding of where their, their um, deficiencies were. Uh, next slide, please. So the tool that we developed uh, is designed essentially to highlight any key elements that uh, we needed to focus some attention on. Um, the questions were organized by major categories and or functional areas, and this tool was designed to open up a dialogue to discuss both compliance issues and best practices. And those areas of uh, concern that we had were desktop and laptop computers, servers, internet, IT policies and procedures, IT training, security, and then equipment and infrastructure. And I'll talk a little bit about each of those categories as we go here. So um, in trying to get a good idea of, of uh, where they were at with their uh, computer technology, uh, on our assessment tool, and, and I'll, we'll have this assessment tool sent out to you guys so you can take a look at it, um, we asked some questions on the, on the assessment tool. And some of the questions that we asked were, uh, do you have a process for keeping your Windows-based PCs up to date with service packs and or security patches? Uh, that's a very important question to ask due to the fact that we've got some substantial uh, viruses, uh, malware, uh, hacking. There's a lot of those types of security issues that are going on uh, even today. Uh, we actually just had a, a security incident here recently that took down um, the entire borough of Palmer. Um, and all, uh, one of our other cities, uh, Valdez, was also affected by this. So these are very important questions asked. Do your computers have virus scanner software installed? Do your computers have the latest version of Microsoft Office? What version do you use? Do your computers have Adobe Acrobat Reader installed? Are your computers connected to a UPS or battery backup or surge protector? Um, are your computers connected to a shared drive for storing or accessing data? Do you back up the data on your computer on a regular basis? Do you utilize VPN for secured access to your business network? So these are some very important questions that we asked um, with regards to the computers uh, in Portgram. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, servers. Uh, we got into uh, asking, does your agency have a file server? Uh, does your agency have an exchange or email server? Is the data on your server backed up daily? Is your server connected to a UPS or battery backup? Do you have a process in place to keep your Windows-based servers up to date with patches under security updates? So there's a theme going on here, and that theme is, are your computers kept up to date? Are they in good condition? Um, do you guys, are, are, do you practice good, safe, secure security practices? Um, and, and those are some of the things that we asked in order to get a good idea of where they were at with the um, server infrastructure and computer infrastructure. And come to find out, uh, they were in, in not so good shape. Uh, so when we completed this assessment on these two categories, we found out that they were uh, definitely in need with just about every single one of those uh, questions that we asked. Uh, next slide, please. Um, internet. Does your agency use the internet? Do all staff have access to the internet? Do you have use? Do you have or use a video conferencing system? Uh, in Alaska, we use a system uh, for uh, telemedicine and for teleconferencing called Video. Uh, is your internet connection fast enough to support your business needs? So this was actually the only category that they scored okay in, um, and. We did find out that they do not utilize a video conferencing system, and so it, when we applied for the grant, we uh, were able to uh, obtain funds to get them two uh, brand new video conferencing systems that will allow them to communicate with any of the villages in the state, including the uh, Alaska Native Ho uh, Hospital. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, IT policies and procedures. So this focuses on uh, four key policies that, that we believe that the tribal organization should have um, and they don't or they didn't. Uh, do you have a policy that explains how staff should and and should not use their desktop and laptop computers, the acceptable use policy? Do you have a policy that explains how staff should keep information, business transactions, and communication secure, uh, an information security policy? Do you have a policy or procedure that details what contingency plans that you should have in case of a various IT emergencies like virus attacks, hacker intrusions, or computer server failure? Disaster recovery policy. And then last was the risk management policy. Does your agency conduct risk assessments? Uh, so we are in the process of assisting them with developing these policies. And um, those were the four key policies. Uh, there will be others, but these were the four immediate ones that we uh, thought that they should have with regards to um, their IT uh, policies and their infrastructure. Uh, next slide. Training. Um, with in the grant that we applied for, we had a um, uh, a section in there for training. Uh, when we completed our needs assessment, uh, we found that there was um, uh, definitely a lack of training in several different areas. Uh, in those areas were uh, Microsoft Office uh, utilizing their their PC, so basic computer training, um, training on developing policies and procedures. Um, training on the complete Office Suite, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, uh, Adobe, um, and then we also um, uh, provided some training, on uh, some, some basic project management training. Uh, so we asked questions such as how has your uh, staff received Microsoft Office training, Word, Excel, PowerPoint? Has your staff received any desktop or laptop computer training? Uh, has your staff received any information security training? Um, safe computer, you know, safe browse, uh, web browsing, um, and, and essential um, basic information security uh, training. Do you, do you have at least one staff member trained to support other computer users uh, in your office? So those are some of the questions that we asked. Based off of our uh, assessment, we um, developed a training program for them, and uh, we actually completed that a couple weeks ago. Um, security, does your office have a firewall? Do you utilize spam filters? Is your virus scanner software kept up to date? Is confidential HIPAA, confidential and HIPAA data kept in a secure location? Do you have timeout settings on your screensaver that locks the computer automatically? Um, do staff that work on sensitive or confidential information use privacy screens? Uh, these are all questions that we asked with regards to security, uh, changing passwords on a regular basis. Uh, we did find out that they were okay in some of these areas, but a majority of these areas were we were a little lacking. So we uh, this assisted us very well in that area. Danielle will talk about what we did to fix the areas that we found out were were uh, they were deficient in. Uh, do you have a reliable phone system, or I'm sorry, equipment and infrastructure? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, do you have a reliable phone system in good working order? This was a big one because. Uh, uh, after completing our assessment, we found out that their phone system was um, over 10 years old. And uh, in our grant that we applied for, we were able to get funding for a brand new phone system. So we installed a uh, brand new Avaya phone system for the tribal office. Uh, is the network wiring in your office in good working condition? We uh, found out that the wiring was pretty poor, so we uh, went through the entire office and replaced and or installed brand new uh, wiring to several of the offices and, and tore out and replaced some of the old wiring that was inside the office. Um, are the routers and switches in your network in good working condition, less than five years old? Do you utilize Wi-Fi? Is your Wi-Fi secured with a strong password, uh, changed regularly? And then do you utilize a centralized network printer, copier, or fax machine? Uh, we found out that they had a very outdated uh, copier um, and we replaced that copier. Uh, we were we were funded for that in the grant as well, and we were able to install a brand new copier uh, fax machine scanner tool for them in their office. So uh, on this tool, they grade, uh, they answer the questions, and then they uh, they assign 
um, a number, a zero or a one, uh, depending on whether, where their compliance is with the question that we're asking. And then the tool, we utilize this tool to uh, come up with a scoring matrix that, that essentially lets us know um, uh, if they score within a certain range that it'll say, congratulations, your, organiz your organization is at or close to where it should be in relation to IT best practices. Um, uh, the second level down is not too bad. Your organization is in fairly good shape from an IT best practice per perspective. To rectify current issues, focus on the areas that have the lowest scoring characteristics. Uh, and then um, down at the very bottom, you know, the lowest score below 27, your organization does not have many IT best practices in place. And and the organization will need to refocus their energies on building the best, the basic systems. Many of these characteristics are left at its current state. There may be catastrophic breach or loss of data. So uh, we found that this IT assessment tool was very helpful to us, especially since we didn't know much about the existing IT infrastructure at the Port Graham Tribal Office. So uh, I would be happy to uh, share the assessment tool that we created and used at the Port Graham Tribal Office with anyone that would like to have it. Um, and also, if anyone has any questions in regards to the grant and how we managed it, what we installed, uh, the technology that was uh, put in place, and how we actually did that, especially from a remote perspective, I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Uh, Danielle will actually give, um, show you guys some slides and uh, some pictures of uh, um, the project and, and what we actually completed out there. Thank right. you. Um, Thank you, Jason. You're welcome. <laughs> Go ahead, Danielle. Okay, so I'm Danielle Malchoff. I'm from Port Graham. Um, just brief history. You can move on to the next slide. <laughs> um, so this is my village, Port Graham. As you can see, it's on the south central tip of Alaska. Federally recognized tribe that serves the Alaska Native people of Port Graham. Um, our, our population is estimated about 170 people, so everybody knows everybody. <laughs> um, we have no way of getting in and out of the village besides by airplane or by boat. So that was um, part of a challenge with this project. Um, you can move on to the next slide. So we worked with um, North Pacific Rim Housing Authority IT, as well as Jason, who was just on um, from Chugachmu IT. And I also worked with, a lot with Chugachmu um, tribal grants writers, and they were able to guide me through my whole grant. Um, and, you know, this is showing a picture of our IT room. And before it had um, no venting, it was extremely hot in there and it made us worry a bit about of our, um, our equipment. So what North Pacific Rim, uh, Scott Grisco and Jason Williams and Kevin did was install a venting system inside of there so our new equipment that was gonna be put in would be properly taken care of. Um, you could move on to the next slide. So off to the right, you can see that was our, our room prior to our new equipment. Um, and it was a, it, we have worked in a very, very antiquated work environment. You know, prior to the server install, we were working on old secondhand desktops that had run years out of warranty dates. And I think the oldest computer I found was from 2008 that somebody was still working on. Backups were inconsistent at best. Only two of our computers in the whole office were being backed up, and one of them hadn't been backed up since it was purchased. So they so happened to. Um, lose anything on our computer, it would have been completely lost prior to this grant. Um, our email was haphazardly and it was scattered over several different providers which we had no control over. The sharing a document was um, actually physically putting it on a USB drive and walking it to the next office to share that with another employee. Our cable was duct taped to the ceiling with and also had tax on it. It was pretty horrendous. Our um, IT information wasn't stored properly, so when staff left their positions, it was a big scramble to just relearn passwords and license keys and essential to daily processes. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so improvements that we made from this project is that now we have a server that which centralizes our storage, our email is being stored locally and is being backed up nightly. All of the items on all user desktops and, and my documents reside on the server and are being backed up nightly. New cable has, was ran through the ceiling and into conduit and installed properly in gang boxes. Uh, a proper router with an effective firewall was installed. The router filters inbound email to the server, weeding out most spam. Email is being managed locally as well. If an employee leaves, you can very easily migrate pertinent email to a new user to avoid a lengthy process of rediscovery. And as you can see, this is what I was talking about. On the left, you can see where everything was tacked or um, set up with duct tape. This was in my office. And so when Chugachmu and North Pacific Rim IT came through, that was the huge improvement is that you can see that it's stored now into a conduit. It's no longer hanging from the ceiling. And it's stored a lot more properly. It looks a lot better in here. Um, next slide. And this was our copier prior to. It was 10 years old. It could only copy, print, and scan. The printer would create its own preferences, like it would only print two-sided, and it was slow when needed for meetings and people needed to get their pamphlets together. It was having to do that in a couple days advance because it was so slow. Well, now this we have a new printer, and it's got the features of scanning documents, emailing documents. We can fax through it. Making copies in bulk is a lot quicker. Printing is easier to manage. It's operated with a touch screen, so it's a pretty easily um, managed. And it has a battery backup to it as well. So our desktop improvements was a huge, huge um, thing for everybody. Receptionist was working on a laptop that was from 2008. It would run very slow and had outdated features, as well as our library computer. The public computer um, we provide at the council was also modeled from 2008 that ran very slowly. And that's to provide, you know, if people want to seek out jobs or anything. So now what we have done is completely got all new desktops and monitors for everybody. Um, we asked for a budget modification and <clears throat> so we could update these computers. And all staff got the, like I said, the desktop. We have double monitors now and a battery backs up and the most updated program, which is what we were also trained in. Our telephone installation, um, in year two, this was the beginning, um, we updated our phone system from the phone on the left to the phone on the right. Not all of the staff in the council had phones. Um, and now everybody has their own phone and with their own extension. We um, went with Alaska Communications System and who also uh, provides us our internet. We were, they brought in somebody, they had trained us in the phones and they're very, very easy to manage. And everybody was given, um, you know, their own instructions on how to operate the phones. And we are able to manage our own phone system. Our tribal administrator, bookkeeper, and myself received extra training to be able to locally manage our phone systems through downloading an app on our computer. We did receive training from Chugachmu, which was amazing. It was a good refresher for a lot of us, and we all learned something new. So we went through Microsoft Outlook, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Adobe, and creating policy and procedure documents. Um, additional training that was provided in all of that was basic computer maintenance, how to change your password, restarting the computer, memory and system usage, control panel and contents, hiding and unhiding files, how to zip, which is compressing a file, email a file from Windows, setting up a screensaver, and safe browsing practices, and basic troubleshooting 
IP address, common error log, um, my computer, system maintenance, and error logs. It was a big refresher and a lot of us um, took in a lot of information we didn't know. So we really appreciated the training. What we're looking into now is vid video and it is implemented in the clinics as Jason mentioned. So, you know, as I said, PortGram is a really small community. It's only 170 people and we're outside of Homer, Alaska, which is the closest city to us, but it's only accessible by boat or plane. The weather here is so unpredictable, um, especially during certain seasons, uh, particularly the winter time. <laughs> and, you know, it's really hard to get in and out of this village when those are the only ways in and out, and that depends on weather. So video, video will provide another way to access communication outside of our village if such circumstances were to arise. So people in the community can utilize video to interview for jobs outside of Port Graham face-to-face -face with prospective employers. Our kids leaving for college will also have the ability to interview face-to-face -face with outside organizations for scholarships. Um, it can be used for meetings outside of our village for our council members and they could that could not make it out due to weather. They can still attend via vid video. Um, job, a job requiring training for someone in the community that either could not or did not want to leave, we could offer a video to them. So that's what we are looking into right now. And those are the big changes here in the Port Grand Village Council from ANA. And I really appreciate everything from ANA as well as Chugach Mute North Pacific Rim. Awesome. Thank you, Danielle. That's that's really amazing to see. and. Um, Having worked in several small villages, um, it's great to see the improvements. I also want to point out here in Alaska that we've had uh, at least two instances where, um, in the case of Sleep Mute, the tribal office uh, uh, was lost in a fire. And in Galena, Loudoun Tribal Council, uh, they were flooded after a spring breakup. And they lost all their data downstairs. They had moved on their computers. They had moved the paper hard files upstairs, um, but they lost uh, the data on their computers downstairs and actually had to go to ANA for an emergency grant to do um, some very costly reconstruction of records. And, and uh, forensic accounting, in the case of the other village, Sleep Mute, is extremely expensive to rebuild your records. So <clears throat> thanks for sharing that. Uh, our next guest is Robin Harkins, uh, the Director of uh, uh, Land Use Planning and GIS. Um, Robin? All right. So um, our ANA project was land, for land use planning and GIS capacity building. Uh, the project objectives were to complete the cultural resource and natural features inventories on all of the lands that the tribe had under the their control as of January 2016. Um, with that, we wanted to develop and implement a comprehensive land use plan that would identify approved uses of our existing lands and then also identify acquisition targets by land use for the next 20 years. So given the land that we currently have and what can be done with it, what other kinds of lands does the tribe want to look at to acquire? Or maybe we have land currently under our ownership that maybe we don't need or maybe it um, doesn't fit any of the um, goals that the tribe has. So in order to do this, we needed to develop um, some predictive modeling capacity and software to identify specific sites and locations for acquisition as well as placement of tribal facilities. So um, with all of this data gathering, we were looking at our IT infrastructure and identified that we had nowhere near enough network storage capacity um, to store aerial photos, LIDAR information, a LANS database. Um, we also had a wide format printer and a scanner that were purchased in the mid-2000s that it was getting very hard to get drivers that fit new computers. So we are kind of um, patch, patching stuff together to get those to work. Our grant allowed us to buy new ones. Uh, we also 
were looking for a high output color laser printer that could do 11 by 17 double sided and fairly high speed so we could print um, maps and diagrams for meetings and presentations to tribal council. Um, with the use of aerial photography and LIDAR information, um, at least for the GIS director, we needed a more high powered computer than what we typically purchased for office staff. Um, so we looked into getting a computer with a higher powered processor, more RAM, and um, better video cards. So um, our network storage needs, aerial photos that we were looking at are anywhere from 200 megabytes to over 5 gigabytes per image. So with 20 parcels of land, we were looking at needing 100 gigabytes of storage just for aerial photos for one flight. So that was one of our um, things we looked at as to how much additional storage do we need. The LiDAR data is the raw files are very, very big, and I had a lot of it stored on external multi-terabyte hard drives because we just didn't have the server space or space on uh, desktops to store that data. And then once you take the raw data and derive more useful data out of it, you're looking at another 30 to 4 plus gigabytes per file and the need to store that data somewhere. Uh, the LANS database that we're developing we want to be able to go to a database on the computer, pull up a parcel of land that the tribe owns, and find out everything we know about that parcel. If there's any CAD drawings, if there's any survey data, we want that all linked together and stored in a central place. And then we also needed to look at backups um, of all of that data. Uh, not that the LIDAR data or the aerial photos need to be backed up every day, but we needed to have a backup of the data somewhere off-site so that if something happened to our main office, we could uh, resurrect that data fairly quickly. Um, printing and scanning needs, like I said before, our uh, plotter and our scanner for wide format prints were very out of date. Um, we wanted something that could do at least uh, maps and drawings 40 inches wide, both black and white in color. We also wanted to be able to print on plain paper, photo paper, mylars, so we could do overlays. And then our forestry and natural resources staff really liked to be able to print on right in the rain paper, so when they went to the field, they could still look at their map and draw on it. So the overall process for our um, grant was we developed a steering committee right off the bat. We hired two new positions, the land use planner and director of GIS. And then we had stakeholder meetings with um, our elders, our youth council, our health advisory board, our natural resources committee to kind of get their take on what they saw as important issues in land use planning and GIS. Um, we gathered up and analyzed a lot of the old plans that had been done for the tribe over the last 20 years. A lot of them had never been implemented. It was a plan that was written and then for whatever reason, the implementation of it either didn't occur or only partially occurred. So we started looking at each piece of property and gathering all of the information we could on that. Um, we do have an economic development arm of the tribe. They acquire some land. We found that sometimes when they acquired land, that information never made it to the administration office. So we're still in the process of gathering everything and getting it in a central location. Um, we got all of our new equipment in place and increased our server storage capacity. And also um, we've obtained some new aerial photography at very high resolution of all of our lands. We're starting now to identify um, land use issues, maybe lands that we believe that we need that we don't currently have, or pieces of land that maybe have some kind of an encumbrance or an easement on them that restricts what we can presently do with that piece of property. Uh, we're in the process of doing that gap analysis and developing the predictive modeling tools that will help us determine where we would like to um, 
add to the tribe's land base and what kind of lands those need to be. And then we'll test and refine those tools, um, generate some land use alternative strategies, set up processes to monitor and revise that plan, like on a five-year um, rolling system. Um, and then we're going to develop location-specific land use plans for the, the lands that we do ha have. So where we're at now, we have our new staff and equipment in place. We've got our land use vision and the tribe's vision, goals, and objectives completed. We're looking at our existing properties. What do we have? Restrictions, easements, encumbrances on that property. Um, and we're going to re-engage our stakeholders. So the same groups of people that we talked to originally, we're going to go back to and talk to now and say, okay, this is what you guys told us the first time. This is the plan we've came up with. Are we still on the same page? Or is there things that you think we need to change? We'll be acquiring additional aerial photography and LIDAR data. And one of the things we're doing with that is we are working with consortiums in the state of Oregon to be able to acquire data at a lower cost for everyone. Um, some examples of what we included in our land database, a lot of it is property characteristics, um, what we call the property, the legal description, maybe the street address, the county, how many acres it is, who it was purchased from, whether it's trust property or fee property and then restrictions or conditions that might be placed on that um, piece of property. For example, zoning, permits, emergency medical coverage, um, whether or not we have water rights, mineral rights, uh, is there utilities there, are there utility easements crossing the property, is it culturally significant, is there an archaeology site or burials on site, um, was it a historic prayer spot or has some other significance to to the tribe. Um, we also have to look at whether things are in the tsunami zones or the flood zones, um, whether or not they can have structures built on them, and for our timber lands, we look at the timber inventory and whether or not that land is really suitable to grow timber for a profit. Here's an example of some of our aerial photography with our current zoning overlaid. So what you see in green has all been managed as forest land, and it's right on the bay in Coos Bay, so it's less than a couple miles from the actual ocean. Very salty air, the trees don't like it and they don't grow real well. We also have a lot of disease in there with um, Swiss needle cast and uh, our root rot disease in the cedar. So we've looked at this piece of property and together with another grant and um, input from multiple uh, tribal members and different committees, we've came up with the plan on the right, which identifies areas that we can zone differently. Um, some land for agriculture, um, keeping a little bit of forest land, but having a lot of open space, some more areas for residential development, and also maybe some employment zone type lands on there. This is another example of our aerial photos and what we can do with our LIDAR data. So this um, piece of property is significant um, historically to the tribe. It's a hunting and gathering area. So the, air, the aerial photo on the left, you can see the different sizes of the trees, um, the meadowy areas or oak woodlands. And then on the right, that's a bare earth hillshade that helps us identify where the creeks are. Um, the ridges, potentially uh, the roads, and other things. Occasionally, you'll also be able to find um, areas where a house was built um, historically um, with this data. So some of the hurdles we had along the way, um, we had a little bit of a staffing delay on the beginning of the grant because getting job descriptions approved through tribal council um, was kind of difficult. Um, so if you're doing a grant where you're adding staff, um, take into consideration the time it takes to get um, that process through HR and tribal councils. 
um, include the cost of new employees in your grants, the, um, you know, do they need a new desk, do they need a new computer, do they need a phone or a cell phone, those are all costs that um, if you don't include them in your grant, when it comes time to hire that employee, somebody's going to ask, how are you going to pay for it? Um, the imagery and LIDAR acquisition, like I said, it's very expensive to do that on your own, so it's a good idea to think about how you can join a consortium or join with other tribes in the area or other landowners to help reduce the cost of that acquisition for everybody. And then we found with the makeup of our original steering committee, that there were a lot of employees on that committee that weren't actually tribal members. So partway through our process, we added more tribal members to get more of a tribal perspective on what we were doing. And then um, when we applied for our grant, we had th certain things in mind that by the time the grant was awarded, the money was here and we were ready to purchase some of the new technology. Technology is changing so fast that we had to make some quick changes. So. Um, you need to be flexible with that. So I think that's it for me um, in a nutshell. Great, thank you, Robin. So we've heard some really good examples of, of how uh, tribes have been using ANA funding, ANA funding to strengthen their, their uh, IT infrastructure and their capacity for their programs. Um, we also have some resources that ANA has developed, and uh, I wanted to feature two of these real quick, and then we'll go into a couple of the Q&A. So the first one I already talked about briefly was the Grant Management Toolkit, and then the other one is the uh, National Nonprofit Toolkit. So next slide. Uh, the, the Grant Management Toolkit is uh, more recent, and this is a, it's, it's a really great resource. Um, it's got the uh, latest um, uh, policies for Tuesday CFR Part 200. Um, it's got some really useful narrative that explains uh, what you need as an organization. Um, it's got, if you're administering a, a a grant, sample grant amendments, um, the internal, assess internal self-assessment tool I mentioned earlier, as well as the financial assessment tool a complete, a complete set of financial policies and procedures, um, a sample chart of accounts, and a, and a project operations manual. So there's a lot of stuff in there that is useful for organizations um, to strengthen their capacity. And the next one is the National Nonprofit Toolkit. This one is a little bit older. No, next slide. This is an older resource. Next slide. There you go. Um, this one, if you no, <laughs> go back. <laughs> The nonprofit toolkit. Yeah, just briefly, uh, this has guidance on developing your mission statement, um, strategic planning, managing nonprofits, uh, more information on financial management. But I want to point to, to, in particular, some complete examples of the case study that was developed in here, where it's got a, a complete strategic plan, a complete employee handbook, and articles of incorporation. So. Both of these are available on the National a a website in the resource library. And lastly, for, for general capacity assessment, if you're looking at uh, pursuing federal funding, next slide, I encourage you to reach out to your, your regional TTA centers. Um, we can go over those assessment tools with you. Uh, you can do it in your own self-assessment and then we can discuss the results and, and also go over some of the resources that we have that might assist you with that. Um, with that, I'll go to Q and A, and that'll be um, Richard. Hello, everyone. Uh, and if uh, you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them in the Q and A section or in the chat. I'll try to uh, forward those to everyone. Uh, one of the questions were: Are the slides going to be emailed out to us? We will be mailing out uh, multiple documents, uh, and I'll make those available. My email address, if you have any questions, is r.perry, P-E-R-R-Y, at number three, S-T-A-R-A-K, dot com. I'll be emailing you uh, out if you have any questions that are offline. Uh, another question that came up was, does program have power outages? 
Some of our regions have power outages that are very hard on our computers and phone systems. So let's see who, poor Graham, Danielle. Uh, you, yeah, uh, so we do, we do come across the power outages here in um, Port Graham. It's not so harsh as it used to be because we do have um, electricity that runs through Soldovia. So if our power goes out, we're only out for like half an hour and we're back up and going. Otherwise, um, I think the longest this last winter we were out for a couple days. That was due to a tree hitting the line or something, but uh, it's not become such a huge issue nowadays. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'll wait a minute or so or a little bit of uh, time to see if there are any other questions. Otherwise, please feel free to uh, reply by email and uh, we will get you connected with the right people and the replies to those questions. Okay, at this time, it looks like we don't have any pressing questions, but again, uh, feel free to ask those offline through email or call me. Uh, and uh, Anthony, do you wanna close us out? Sure, if you wouldn't mind pushing out the evaluation, um, we'd appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to thank our presenters today for, for sharing about their unique projects. Um, they're all really exciting projects and uh, you know, it's 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 neat to see how A and A resources are being used to really make a huge difference in, in the communities that we serve and look forward to hearing more about the things that you'll be doing uh with your organizational infrastructure uh improvements. So uh Guayana from Alaska region and uh we'll be closing out here again. Uh, can you put the evaluation in the chat so they can click on it or yeah. Okay. So thanks again, everybody, and thanks again to our presenters.